avoidance and treatment of rod fractures. Uh, and uh, there's, if there's one thing I know about, it's certainly rod fractures and how to treat them. And I've learned a lot about how to try to avoid them along the way. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, none of them are particularly relevant to this. No company wants to sponsor rod fractures. Um, we know that advances in instrumentation over the last decades and use of osteobiologic biologics have helped us to be able to do a lot more with deformity correction. There's no doubt about that. But we still get pseudarthrosis, we still get rod fractures, and a, a failure of our instrumentation can often be the first sign that something has failed to heal. Um, and, and, and they frequently require revision surgery. And as Chris Ames pointed out, it's, it's a huge burden, not only economically, but I think more importantly to our patients to have to go back and uh, redo surgery and uh, put them through um, another procedure. This is a study led by Peter Pashas through the ISSG. It was in JBJS in 2016. And what he looked at is revision rates in 243 adults treated for spinal deformity. And it's from our prospective database. And for this, uh, we excluded wound complications. Uh, but what we found is that about 16% of patients ultimately required revision surgery over two years. And by far the most common reason was rod breakage or pseudarthrosis followed by PJK or implant related. So rod fracture continues to be a significant problem. We've looked at this extensively through the ISSG and this was one of our first attempts before our, data, our database was mature. We did a retrospective study to look back at what had our experience been that we brought to the table as our group was forming. And you can see what we found in a large series of, of rod fractures in, in, in patients. You can see these, each one of these bars represents the extent of fusion in a different patient across the levels uh, that had a rod fracture. And the, the dark squares are PSOs. The gaps are where the fractures occurred, and single means one rod versus two rod. But what you can see that jumps out right away is that the PSO side is extremely vulnerable to rod fracture followed by L5-S1. Those seem to be where a lot of the rod fractures were clustering. And we saw that overall about 7% of our patients were having a rod fracture. In the PSOs, it was almost 16%. Most of them were occurring within a year. Early failures were most common with PSOs. And this is a retrospective study, so we had limited ability to look at risk factors, but we found that sagittal malalignment uh, postoperatively, and greater body mass index seem to be risk factors for developing rod fracture. We subsequently, once our database was mature, looked at our prospective data. And we had 200 patients that met criteria, mean age of 55. 42% uh, of these were revision procedures. Mean levels fused was 12. And so these are, these are large procedures. A quarter of them had a PSO. We had a, a distribution of the rod characteristics, the diameter, the materials. And, and similar to our retrospective study, we saw that almost one in 10 was developing a rod fracture. And they were occurring at a mean of about 15 months, ranging anywhere from as early as three months out to two years plus. And we found that those that had a rod, did not have a rod fracture, we had them out 19 months with follow-up. And so we were, um, uh, the, the, no one's ever completely out of the woods. Uh, those patients had 19 months follow-up. You can see that the majority of the rod fractures were occurring within one to two years, but there were several of them occurring much earlier than that, perhaps even earlier than you would expect fusion to be occurring. We found rod fracture occurring in 22% of PSOs, so almost one in five, or about one in five. And this rate ranged substantially across sites. So for PSOs, there was one center that had one in three of their PSO patients coming back for rod fracture, which is really quite unacceptable. But that range really caught our attention. If there's that dramatic of a range, maybe that's telling us that some centers are doing things differently that are lowering their rod fracture rates. And again, we plotted out where we were seeing our rod fractures from our prospective series. And again, consistent with the retrospective series, PSOs were very vulnerable to rod fracture, followed by L5-S1. We could do a little more analysis in this series because it was prospective and we had more granular data. We found that older patients with greater body mass index had a higher risk of rod fracture. It's the patients that had the worst deformities at baseline for which we were doing the most dramatic corrections were the ones that had the highest risk. And again, it was a 9% rod fracture rate, 22% in PSOs. And there was this substantial variability, which is what really caught our attention. And so we started looking at what are some centers doing versus what are others doing, and what could we collectively do as a group to try to reduce this significant source of revision surgery in these patients. 
One of the studies that was done was led by Chris Ames through, through UCSF in a biomechanics study. And, and the question was, is what's happening at that PSO site? Does it have something to do with how sharp that rod is bent? So we looked back at some clinical cases where PSOs had been performed and rods had fractured to see what were the angles that were bent in those rods. And we found that 20, 40, and 60 degrees represented a good um, uh, a spectrum of what was seen in the clinical cases. And so rods were bent to those angles and submitted uh, to axial loading. And you can see some of the figures from the manuscript. And we found what we expected to see. As you bend that rod more and more sharply across the PSO site, the fatigue life reduces. So we're compromising that rod by bending it sharply to capture those screw heads across the PSOs. So what can we do about that? Well, this is a study led by Manish Gupta through the ISSG in which we wanted to look at different rod configurations and see, do they matter? If, you, if we use multiple rods or put them in in different patterns or do inner body fusions, can that reduce the, the risk of rod fracture? And so we look, used our multi-center uh, uh, database. Uh, we came up with a classification system for it as well. I can show here. Um, there are different approaches to placing these rods. They're the classic accessory rods, which many of us probably commonly place, where we attach an anchor onto the side of the primary rod. It can either be medial or lateral. I tend to put mine medial so that I can preserve the lateral gutters for fusion. But we attach this, these rods to bridge on the primary rod. And so these are called accessory rods. And you can have a third or a fourth, which would be 3A or 4A for the classification system that Manish came up with. Or there's this more novel approach across the PSO to do what's called a satellite rod, where it's basically just floating as its own rod. So you can see up immediately above and below the PSO, there's a separate rod connecting those screw heads, and the primary rod passes over or adjacent to those uh, separately attached rods. And you can imagine what this is doing here, is you're no longer having to bend this primary rod as sharply to go in there and capture those screw heads. So this rod is no longer as compromised um, as it would be if it were the only rod capturing those screw heads. And so you can have a 4S where you have two satellite rods and two primary, or a 3S where there's one satellite and two primary rods. And so in the study, 264 patients met criteria, mean age of 62, PSO levels most commonly at L3 followed by L4 and L2. Interestingly, if you look at uh, across the number of rods and rod configurations, the, the, the patient population was fairly similar. They had similar age, BMI, gender, OR time, blood loss, levels fused, uh, baseline radiographic parameters. It ended up, they, end, they were fairly similar populations. And we found the overall site uh, a, a failure rate was high, consistent with previous studies. The timing of failures, again, the most common, one to two years, uh, followed by uh, six months to one year. And we found, not surprisingly, if you add more rods, the rate of rod fracture was reduced. So just across the board, three to four rod constructs had lower failure rates than just two rods. We compared those that had accessory rods versus satellite rod configurations, and satellite rods were much more protective. If you look at the revision rates for rod fracture, with the two rod uh, uh, traditional construct, 21%, with accessory rods, 11%, Satellite rods at the time of data extraction, 0%. So they seem to be very protective across the PSO site. We also found that bigger rods are better. If you uh, put in a bigger rod, yeah, you get a better uh, protection across the, the PSO site. There's uh, fewer uh, risks of rod fracture. We found that titanium had higher rates of rod fracture. Um, uh, the difference, though, uh, with, uh, was not significant uh, um, uh, uh, if it was three to four rod constructs, but was for the overall um, uh, study, as well as if you just used two titanium rods. Inner body fusion was also significantly protected. So leaving those disk spaces open adjacent to the PSO um, uh, left a vulnerable place where fusion may not occur, and addition of uh, inner body fusions next to the PSO was protective. This is a paper that just came out um, in operative neurosurgery not too long ago, uh, led by uh, Manish Gupta's son, who's uh, a budding orthopedic surgeon from what I understand. Um, and this compared uh, two different sets of patients, one where there's two primary rods were used, the traditional approach, and the other was where satellite rods were used. And so these were all PSO patients to see if, if the four rod technique with satellite rods is an improvement across uh, uh, on what we had traditionally done. And again, the traditional two rod technique you can see, you can see another example of the satellite rod technique here. 
There were some differences between the groups. There was a retrospective study. Some of them favored um, two rods, and some of these differences favored four rods. I think it balances out. Uh, for example, the two-rod uh, technique had the vast majority were cobalt chromium, whereas titanium was what was most commonly used in the satellite technique. And, and the rod diameters were perhaps a bit bigger for the four-rod versus the two-rod, but some of these differences um, balance each other out. Certainly a, a more uh, a refined study could be done to further demonstrate the results. And what the results were is that rod breakage uh, did not occur in any of the satellite rod technique uh, cases, whereas it occurred in 25% of those with just the primary rods. There was one case of pseudarthrosis with the satellite rod technique, and that was a case where there was infection and the instrumentation had to be removed, so it was declared a pseudarthrosis. But otherwise, no pseudarthrosis in those cases, so very protective. A uh, case example of a, of a, of, of, of a uh, satellite rod technique, 55-year-old woman who came to me uh, from Florida. She had had an L5-S1 T-lift in 2012, developed adjacent level disease, um, uh, had an L4-5 T-lift in 2015, developed adjacent level disease, had an L3-4 T-lift in 2016, and then finally someone gave up on her and put in the, the, the good old spinal cord stimulator. And you can see here her, her x-rays, you can see her CT, she's basically quite flat back. She has a very significant PILL mismatch. Uh, and, and yet again, she's got another adjacent level disease, so you're marching right on up. And so this is a case where you might be tempted just to continue the, the trend here and give her her fourth T-lift, um, uh, but then she's going to be back and she's going to be back. And eventually you will have created a very significant flat back. And so I did a PSO here, an extended um, um, L4 PSO. And you can see uh, with the satellite rod technique here, uh, a very nice realignment, very happy patient. Hopefully, although no surgery is guaranteed to be the last one, but hopefully she won't just be back for yet an adjacent level disease before long. And you can see I put in a spacer here too at the cross the PSO site uh, for support. Another thing that's important to remember is that there's a combination of why rods fracture. You know, you can compromise the rod, as I, as I showed earlier, where if you bend that rod more and more, you lower the fatigue life of it. That's one reason rods are breaking. And that might account for a lot of the early rod fractures, especially those occurring before you might expect fusion to, have, have, have to be complete. But then there's also those rods that may not be compromised necessarily, but if you don't get a fusion, over time they become pro compromised and they fail. And one of the ways we can promote fusion is off-label osteobiologics. And, and there's a lot of baggage that come with them. They're expensive, they're off-label, controversies. But there's data to support that, that it, it works. You know, this is a study from the NYU group uh, looking at the administrative database for the state of New York from 2008 to 2011. And they looked at adult spinal deformity fusions, eight levels or more, and looked at the rate of reoperation if you use BMP versus not. And it was 5% versus 34%. Quite dramatic. Uh, you can look at some of the differences between BMP and no BMP. Uh, BMP was more likely to use, be used in white patients. Um, it was more likely to be used in patients with private insurance or other payment. And I don't, this is New York, so I don't know what other means, maybe cash or diamonds or gold or who knows what. But, but the, so there were differences in payers and who's getting the BMP. Um, and of course, BMP was associated with greater hospital charges. But again, if you look at it, and this is multivariate analysis, so you're controlling for all those things that might be going through your head of thinking, well, maybe it's related to how bad the deformity is or their comorbidities. But even if you control for all of those things, no BMP use, 7.5-fold higher rate of revision surgery. So it does work. Several other studies show that BMP is effective. And so one way of reducing rod fracture is by trying to ensure that we get a fusion. Um, there may be other ways, uh, but BMP I, I tend to use. It's off-label, uh, but I think it does a good job at trying to uh, achieve a good fusion and try to prevent those later rod fractures where the rods become fatigued. This is a study uh, Shea Best led looking at risks associated with BMP. And we very meticulously collect our complications through the ISSG, and this is 279 patients. Uh, where BMP was used, and we looked at dose, we looked at location, and we could not see any evidence of an increased risk of acute major neurological or wound complications, at least up to 90 days. So those are occurring early on. We could not see any um, increased risk associated with use of BMP. So what about some strategies to address rod fracture? Um, I'll show just a few case examples here at the end uh, to, to show many of you, I'm, I'm sure all of you, if, if you've done these surgeries, <laughs> you get rod fractures and you have your ways of repairing them, but I'll show you some of them that I've encountered. This is a 71-year-old man with uh, Parkinson's, which always uh, makes me a little uneasy when patients come in with deformity and Parkinson's, um, presented with back pain and he could not really stand up or function. His quality of life was very poor. 
Um, Spine-wise, all he had done was a, a bilateral SI fusion. You can see his alignment here is rather poor. It's a bit of a neuromuscular picture as well. Did a long fusion on him, very happy, very happy. He could walk, he could function. Um, then he came back after a pop 18 months later, and you can see that his rod has fractured um, here on the left side. Went in and spliced in a piece of rod on the left side there and reinforced it with an accessory rod and then also put an accessory rod on the contralateral side. And then there's always the question of do you replace both rods, you know, because if you have one that's broken, you worry about the contralateral side being fatigued and more vulnerable. Um, I did not replace the other rod. This is a T4 to pelvis, you know, and you could splice in another piece, but I did not. I reinforced across that level with an accessory rod. And guess what? He came back eight months later, and he had refractured at the same place, and he fractured above on the other side, above where it had been reinforced. And so, you know, you, you, what, what would I have done differently here? I don't know. Um, but uh, um, you can see how you can get recurrent rod fractures. I went in and spliced the other side, put in a, a piece of rod, did the same thing on the other side, new rod and reinforced, and then just put in a whole lot of osteobiologic and bone graft. Um, he had, I think he'd had a, a major colon surgery or colon resection, so I was compromised at doing an A-lift or doing something from the front, which is what I may have considered otherwise. Um, but uh, so he's done well. He's out quite a ways now, and that's maintained itself. Another example, 68-year-old woman, uh, severe low back pain, uh, claudication, radiculopathy, diffuse lower extremity weak, uh, weakness. She's been in a wheelchair for several months. She'd had uh, uh, some cervical surgery, but more importantly, six posterior uh, thoracolumbar procedures, mo multiple bony failures, revision, and kyphoplasty. Uh, you can see she's failed somewhat um, on her imaging here. Up close, you can see that she's um, uh, basically has a, a collapse of the vertebral body here. There's a, there's a couple um, uh, peak cages in here, as well as a lot of cement. Uh, she has very significant uh, a neurological comp or a, a neural element compression here as well. And so she underwent a T10 to the ilium, uh, two, three, and five, one inner body fusions, trying to get that to heal across there. And she did really quite well, remarkably well. Two years later, came back uh, with new onset back pain. And uh, no, nothing really obvious on her imaging, but of course, if you look at dynamic imaging, it comes out that she has a, a fracture there across the level where she has um, uh, the cement and the, the peak in there, uh, difficult to get to fuse across there. And I went back in, replaced the rods, both rods completely, um, and then buttressed across with an accessory rod, lots of osteobiologic, lots of bone graft. And last case example is a little bit different. A 70-year-old woman who came to me, she'd had quite an extensive uh, 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 surgical history, multiple uh, proximal junctional failures requiring serial extensions. And she came to me uh, with significant back pain whenever she'd stand. She was really in incapacitated. And they couldn't really see any evidence of rod fractures. She'd been to see a couple other surgeons and they couldn't really figure out what was wrong with her. But if you look really carefully at her, at her uh, dynamic imaging, um, she has um, basically her, her connectors from one of her many stages of surgeries have, have separated where she has pseudarthrosed across that level. And you could, you could argue just to go in there and re reconnect that, but you've got two really long lever arms now and trying to get that to, to, to fuse may be a bit challenging. So the way we handled this was a, was a lateral inner body here. Uh, followed by going back in and replacing the rods uh, distal uh, to those connectors with new connectors and then putting a bridge across uh, an accessory rod to, uh, to, to reinforce across there, and she's done quite well. So in summary, um, instrumentation failures, they can often be the first sign that uh, something hasn't healed. Uh, the incidence uh, remains high. I think if you look back at our, uh, our experience uh, from the past where it's 9% overall for rod fracture and 22% for PSOs. I think if you looked at that going forward now through the ISSG, I think that would be quite a bit lower uh, because of the employment of these different techniques for rod configurations. Uh, but nevertheless, the rate of rod fracture remains high. There are a number of risk factors that we can take into account when we're counseling patients. Uh, in the setting of PSO, a lot of that seems to be a fatigue life of the rod is compromised when we bend it. And so consider using, uh, at a minimum, accessory rods, if not satellite rods, uh, when doing PSOs. Even now, when I do Smith-Peets extensively in the lumbar spine, I'll put accessory rods. So I don't just use those for um, uh, three-column osteotomies. Um, satellite rods, again, are valuable for PSOs. Larger rods, potentially cobalt chromium and stainless steel may be more protective. Really consider inner body fusions at vulnerable points, L5-S1, L4-5, adjacent to PSO levels. And whether, you, um, whether, uh, uh, whether payers will pay for it or not, um, and, and, and the controversy whether it settles down around BMP eventually, um, it does appear to be effective. It does appear to work in, in reducing rod fracture rates. Thank you.